Hello everybody, this is Peter Svidler for Chess24 and today I thought I'd record something uh, uh, slightly unusual. It is a recap video of uh, rounds 4 and 5 of the Norway Chess um, 2018, but uh, I also wanted to connect two games which seem on surface very very different and are uh, once again optically uh, only similar because the one player participates in both of them. I wanted to connect them by uh, a seemingly arbitrary thread and talk a little bit about the role of preparation in modern uh, elite chess and uh, to use those two games to uh, highlight two very very differing approaches to how people prepare against players they have been playing for basically their entire uh, elite career uh, and in both cases that little bit of preparation was uh, wildly successful, but it was very, very different in approach and nature. And uh, <clears throat> I will try uh, not to talk as, uh, as much as I normally do, because otherwise this video will uh, be completely, uh, completely endless. Um, and with that, uh, with that intro, let's uh, start covering the games. Uh, the first game uh, we have in front of us is the game Sergei Karekin played with, with the white pieces against uh, Maxim Vashiele Grav in round four. And this is an example of sort of pinpoint precision, uh, very, very targeted preparation against a player who has a very stable repertoire, uh, which is very useful when you're preparing, uh, uh, obviously, because you can actually with a high degree of certainty get uh, positions on the board which are very far advanced. <clears throat> uh, Karekin in general is uh, one of the best Spanish players in the world, for instance. I think playing 1e4 comes a lot more naturally uh, to him than playing 1d4. But in that game he opened with uh, 1d4 and VL can be trusted not to dodge uh, the Grunfeld. And Karekin played the system against the Grunfeld, which I can't really remember playing uh, him playing before. He went uh, for the classical Grunfeld with bishop c4. Uh, somewhat surprisingly, the same thing has been done, uh, had been done in, in round four also by Levon Aronian against Shah Mamidyarov. Levon also won his game, but I'm not going to be covering that. This is not an opening survey video. It's, uh, uh, you know, the theme is slightly different. Uh, c5, knight e2, knight c6, bishop e3, castles, castles. This is the, the central position of the opening. And there's plenty of moves uh, black can make here. But MVL, uh, I think, from a certain moment on, he was more or less exclusively playing b7, b6 in this position, which is a very topical attempt to make more or less a forced draw. It's not really aimed at anything better than a forced draw. But it's a very concrete variation because uh, black is aiming for your typical b6, uh, bishop b7 lines. But he is doing it without wasting a tempo on knight a5. And that means that uh, typical replies that white would prefer uh, after knight a5, bishop d3 is included, are a lot uh, less attractive for white because the knight is still on c6, still putting pressure on the white center. And the way to try and refute this line is what Karekin has done. d c5, queen c7, knight d4. Black goes knight e5. I will not be covering this in any kind of great detail because uh, that would take uh, too much time. Let's just say that uh, this position is reasonably well known. And the main line here, including a number of my own games uh, and also I think some MVL games, the main line here uh, goes, uh, how does this go? f4 first, knight g4, bishop takes c5, black goes a6. There's nothing stronger but, uh, than knight a3, queen c7, bishop d4, e5, f takes e5, knight takes e5. And uh, black has uh, just enough compensation for the pawn here, basically. It's, it's, never, it's never more than uh, a compensation for the pawn, but black should be able to make a draw here with precise play if he does enough, uh, enough work at home. Uh, so this position appeared on the board. Uh, MVL took a little bit of a pause after castles on move 10, and then they proceeded to blitz out all these moves. And here Sergei played rook b1. I have uh, told Jan uh, during the live broadcast, and I'm sure this is in my files, but I couldn't remember what it said. 
And I have since checked, it is in fact in my files uh, as basically a single line of text which says uh, a6, knight a3. Uh, there is also knight d4, which I believe is maybe even covered in larger detail in my file than knight a3 for some reason. But knight a3 is also covered, queen c7, uh, f4, rook d8, and it says that because the knight comes to g4, this is obviously empty. And this is objectively absolutely correct. White does not have any advantage here. But Sergei found a very venomous idea and a very forcing idea in this position, uh, which is, you know, a very typical thing in high-level chess these days. Basically, it's an idea for one game, which is not going to uh, win you this one game uh, very often, but it will win occasionally. And you are not expecting to repeat it ever again, because uh, any kind of uh, half-series check with the computer will show how to hold this for black. But against a surprised opponent, this can be uh, very, very effective. So Gay played queen c2 here, knight g4 obviously, takes, takes, and f5. Aiming to play against this bishop on g4. The obvious plan here is something like h3, bishop h5, bishop f4, and then g4. Stopping queen g3 check, counter play, and just winning the bishop. And uh, MVL played gf5. This is still perfectly fine for black, but uh, because any kind of an assault on the Grunfeld, I take somewhat personally uh, as, you know, a threat to how I define myself to, to a certain degree. And I'm only slightly joking, sadly. Uh, I will uh, deviate somewhat uh, from the stated aim of this video and... Uh, uh, show you some opening lines, just in case you are wondering what's happening here. Uh, GF5 is still fine, but maybe uh, uh, even more direct uh, is the move queen e5 here, attacking the pawn on c3. Uh, if white goes uh, knight c4, queen takes c3, takes, takes, now the bishop has the e2 square, so it's impossible to catch, and after something like rook fc1, bishop f6, White probably isn't worse yet, uh, but black has no problems whatsoever. It's uh, a very, very comfortable position for black. The main move here is rook f4 after queen f5. Black goes uh, g takes f5. It's also possible to start with bishop h5, but this is more direct. h3, bishop h5, rook takes f5. This is all more or less forced, queen g3. And here white has a choice. White can play bishop f2, then uh, queen goes to g6. Uh, king h1, uh, renewing ideas to catch this uh, bishop on h5. Black can go e6, uh, and actually should go e6, rook takes e5, and in this position there's already a, ch a choice. You can go uh, rook c8, but the most direct way to make a draw, arguably, is to play queen h6, a really weird looking move, but uh, it creates a very strong threat of rook d2, and after knight c4, we finally solve our issues uh, with the bishop on h5, it uh, attacks the pawn on e4, which is quite weak. And after bishop g3, black can play rook d5, uh, attacking the rook on c5, once again using this uh, pin. Rook c7, queen becomes active on, on, on the g5 square. And some position like this, uh, black is not really in any kind of danger and should hold very comfortably. And instead of that, white can also play bishop f4, which I suspect is why uh, MVL did not go for this entire line, because the position after queen h4 and king h2 looks like black could be completely lost. White is threatening g3, bishop g3, bishop g5, all these things. But black can play bishop g4 here. It is strictly uh, mathematically the only move, but after that move, uh, black is just completely fine. Once again, rook c5, rook c8, and very, very typical situation when as long as black doesn't lose any, uh, any of his larger pieces, as long as his light square bishop is out of danger, any kinds of positions like this where black is currently a pawn down are just completely fine for him because all of these pawns are so weak and uh, these bishops, uh, in particular if it gets to e6 for instance, are so strong that black has just tremendous positional compensation for the pawn. So I believe that queen e5 just holds mathematically here, and uh, if you're worried about the future of this line, uh, you shouldn't be. Gf, which is a move that MVL made in reply, uh, is not bad at all, but uh, after knight c4, 
it becomes problematic for black because you, you need to start making somewhat uh, uncomfortable only moves. And here, once again, uh, I suspect that it is, strictly speaking, better to play rook b8 than the move that MVL chose. After rook b8, if white takes on b8, black takes with the queen, and it's very, very important that the queen comes to b5, for instance, after h3, black plays queen b5, uh, hitting this <clears throat> uh, knight on c4. And the same applies to ef, uh, queen b5. And the knight has to go somewhere which gives black uh, this uh, e2 square for his pieces. And after queen c1, he can, for instance, even maybe go back to b5, uh, uh, hinting that the bishop will now come to e2 if white doesn't play queen c2. Yeah, and the position is just quite comfortable for black. In fact, white probably should take the repetition with queen c2. And if after rook a b8, white plays rook b1, now you can uh, even take on e4, queen takes e4, bishop e6, and after bishop f4, you can give up this exchange with queen b7, uh, bishop takes b8, uh, queen takes e4, rook takes e4, rook takes b8. And this is a type of a position which MVL was basically aiming for in the game as well. Black is more or less never worried in positions like this, because once again, these pawns are, these pawns are so weak and the bishops are so strong that black, despite being an exchange down for the time being, should be able to make a very comfortable draw here. And uh, I think, once again, uh, rook ab8 uh, objectively just holds here. But e6 is, once again, still fine. But uh, here, black starts encountering uh, some problems. h3, bishop h5, ef, ef. And here, uh, Sergei plays a very concrete move, uh, bishop g5. Uh, just briefly, I sort of glossed over uh, the point that fe4 is not a particularly good move, but the point of the whole idea of knight c4 here is that in this position, uh, combined ideas of rook b7 and bishop f4 followed by knight b6 make a black situation quite critical, and uh, this is quite obviously unattractive. Back to the position after bishop g5. And uh, the computer here says that for instance, after rook e8, black already doesn't really have concrete and quality because after knight b6, rook a7, knight g5, followed in most cases by a timely c3, c4, white has tremendous compensation for the one sacrificed pawn and in fact has uh, quite a lot of pressure. And there is a very, very beautiful variation here that I wanted to show you in particular. After queen d6, whoops, sorry about that, I will, <laughs> I will get us the correct position momentarily. Uh, sorry for that misclick. After queen d6, uh, apart from uh, queen d2, uh, rook d7, and c4, which is quite decent, white also has this beautiful idea of playing rook b1, and after uh, rook takes c1 and rook takes c1, black has to play h6, to which white replies queen takes f5 and has still some pressure, but this is not the line I wanted to show you. I wanted to show you why uh, after rook takes c1, queen takes d5 is not very good. Here, white plays rook e8 check, bishop f8, and at first I couldn't really understand what was happening, because if you play bishop h8, you immediately lose to rook a8. Uh, all of black's problems disappear. And then the computer told me that the move that white makes in this position is queen takes f5. I was so impressed by this. Uh, the point being that if the queen actually gets taken, now bishop h6 is mate in 5, because black, despite being a rook and a piece up and having sorry, a queen and a piece up, and having a check on the first move, still cannot find any square on the board from which he can cover this bishop on f8. And uh, if after queen takes f5, black plays queen c6, uh, fireworks continue, white takes on f8, queen takes f8, and makes a quiet move, queen takes h7. And despite here being a rook down, the threat of queen h8 mate is so strong that black has to return the rook immediately and try to make a draw in this endgame. Maybe he will, maybe he won't, but not very pleasant. But uh, after the somewhat counterintuitive rook f8, the main point of which is basically that after knight b6, the second rook comes to e8, and this is a much more stable uh, setup for black with two rooks uh, on the eighth and nothing on a7. a7 really is not a good square for uh, any rook. 
uh, here black holes and after 93 which is probably the correct response to rook f8 black also holds after something like queen e5 knight f5 and bishop, bishop g6 and i think i'll stop with the uh, critique of mvl's play because i promised not to turn this into a theoretical opening video otherwise it really will take a long long time mvl's move after bishop g5 is also not bad at all but objectively not the best he played a 5 of 4 offering up this rook on d8 but creating this very important idea of bishop h5 g6 and in general trying to switch this uh this bishop back into play but it was answered by uh queen f2 i'm pretty sure sergey was still in book uh, at this point queen f2 is uh, by far the trickiest and the uh the most critical move in this position and this is where it went off the rails completely for uh, for MVL. Had he played rook e8 here, knight b6 uh, and rook a7, the game still would have continued. White is uh, definitely uh, at least a little bit better here, for instance, after a very similar idea to what we've seen before, knight d5 and rook f1, sorry, knight d5, uh, queen c6 and uh, rook f1. Once again, using the, the back rank problems uh, black constantly has here uh, to uh, to good advantage, but black after f6 uh, holds on uh, grimly and might uh, very well not lose this position. But MVL uh, I think uh, got very much uh, into the mood of uh, uh, I shall not retreat and if you want to take on d8 I will give you the chance to take on d8 and played f3. And from this moment onwards I think the game is uh, beyond his reach basically. Bishop takes d8, uh, rook takes d8, and queen h4. This was probably the last really difficult move of the game, and Sergei found it very convincingly. Uh, hitting the rook on d8 is very important, because white often will have a very important tactical idea of going rook b7, distracting the queen on c7. And after x, f takes g2, white of course doesn't recapture this pawn, he doesn't really uh, need to open up his king like this, he goes rook e1, bishop f3. And here, uh, the computer suggests that uh, rook e7, queen c6, and rook b1 is stronger than uh, what Sergei has done. But from a, a human standpoint, his play was very natural and very strong. Rook e3, bishop c6, uh, rook b1, just completely mobilizing his forces, uh, threatening uh, rook e7. Also, the knight comes to e5, which is a very, very strong square. And it just feels like black will not save this position. Uh, MVL played bishop d5, rook g3, f6, knight g3. And here he committed his final mistake, but even after the objectively strongest king h8, knight f4, bishop f7, rook takes g2, I mean, I think it's enough to basically look at this position with the naked eye to, to realize just how bad it is for black. And I don't think you can expect to save this uh, against a player as strong as Kayakin. Instead, MVL took on a2, and after c4, there's just not enough defenders on the board. One more precise move was required, queen d6, knight f4, queen d4 check. And here, if you carelessly take on g4, black has just enough compensation after bishop takes c4, uh, because if you do exactly the same as in the game, queen h6 and knight h5, black has a perpetual with bishop g5 and bishop c4. But uh, king h2, which was instead played by Karakin, uh, removes uh, all this counterplay, and the game finished. Bishop takes, queen h6, f5, knight h5. And here, compared, uh, compared to the previous line, there will never be more than uh, one check to this very, very safely uh, en en ensconced king on h2. Uh, and uh, in view of all that, uh, black resigned. And uh, this is the first game that I wanted to show you. And this game is uh, basically a, a demonstration of uh, uh, Team Karyakin's uh, very, very precise preparation against specifically not MVL as a chess player as such, uh, as much as it is a preparation against MVL's uh, very well-defined uh, repertoire. And MVL is also uh, a very principled player. I, so what I said about not preparing against him as a player is perhaps not entirely correct, because he will not suddenly start playing uh, different openings just because you played 1d4 against him and played for and played the line of the Grunfeld, which you haven't played before. He will stick to his own guns and he will 
uh, uh, try to prove that his repertoire holds and his analysis holds. And uh, they found a way to pose very concrete problems to him, uh, which he had not been able to, to solve over the board. So this is one type of very, very high level preparation that goes on uh, uh, in between, uh, between players of this caliber. But in the very next round, we have seen uh, something uh, also extremely effective, but something very, very different in spirit. Uh, and once again, it, it, it happened in a game which featured uh, Sergei Karekin, but this time on the black side of it, uh, with Fabiano Caruana playing uh, the white pieces. And this game featured, I think, also very, very specific preparation, but the preparation not aimed at posing uh, concrete force problems in, in a line that you expect to happen, but a preparation aimed at getting, obviously, a very, very strong player uh, into trouble by giving him too many choices and, uh, what's more, too many somewhat undefined choices so that, so that he, you know, giving him freedom to uh, I'm tempted to use the uh, giving him enough rope to hang himself line here uh, because uh, and Jan was I think very very perceptive about this during the live broadcast and I want to credit him with the origins of this idea that I'm now using uh, for this video that uh, Karekin as a chess player is uh, tremendously well prepared uh, has uh, tremendous heart so to speak is uh, very very tenacious in defense in general uh, squeezes everything, uh, every every last ounce of uh, out of his talent and his uh, capabilities, and out of you know the good positions he has and the bad positions he has. And if there is a weakness he has as a chess player, it is perhaps uh, formulating plans and in general playing in positions which he doesn't know particularly well and maybe sees for the first time, where he cannot really calculate his way out of them. He just needs to. Uh, play them by feel, and he sometimes flounders to some degree in, in these situations. Obviously, all of this comes with the caveat that we're still talking about somebody rated 2782, so he's not floundering really badly. But um, edges are small uh, in, in games within players like these, and uh, whenever you can find an edge, you should be, you should be using it. So uh, let's have a look at this game. Fabi goes one c4. Once again, maybe not the main open, uh, th uh, he, not the main weapon he has in the openings, but he has a very specific idea. Knight f6, knight c3. Sergei is a dedicated uh, e5 and four knights player these days, so you can assume you get this position against him. Bishop b4 is uh, by far the most popular move here. Queen c2. Uh, Castling and allowing knight d5 is uh, rather unfashionable here, and very few people do it these days. So black generally takes on c3, queen takes, queen e7, and here all theory goes a3, d5, d4, black takes, white takes, black takes, takes, goes c5. This is supposed to be completely empty, and there have even uh, been some recent games which have proven that this is not very much. Instead of all this, uh, Fabio goes b3, which is a move that has been employed recently, I think a couple of times by the Dutch player Walter Spoolman. I uh, apologize if I mispronounce his name. And the tactical point of this idea is that if black plays d5, you can go d4, knight e4, and queen e2. And, uh, well, it, uh, some explanation is needed. If black does exactly the same as in the line I've just discussed, it's quite, well, obviously not, not queen h4 here, because you don't want to blunder queen e5, but something like queen f4. Uh, a position like this, where the bishop uh, immediately uh, threatens to come out to b2, compared to a position like this, where the bishop is locked in on c1, is obviously a huge improvement for white. Uh, and, you know, this comparison is greatly in favor of white. Which is why, uh, if black goes d5, d4, he probably should be playing knight e4. But here, after queen b2, the position becomes very sharp and very, very concrete. And uh, I'm sure you can attempt to sort of click your way out of this by trying to equalize after queen b4, or maybe some kind of a slightly quieter move like bishop e6. 
uh, could lead to playable positions for black. But if you are completely unaware of all this, you will probably not even enter into all these complications and play something like castles, which is what Sergei did. Bishop b2, rook e8. And here, Fabi goes a3, uh, which seems like uh, it really is very much on the slow side. And uh, it's, uh, I think, very much a demonstration of what Fabi is trying to do here. He is not really committing to playing uh, either d4 or even bishop 2 castles uh, very early. He wants to give black as many options as possible. And <clears throat> Sergei, first of all, started burning time here. And secondly, I think he started inventing uh, ideas where, you know, playing uh, the most natural and the most obvious moves probably would have served him better. Black can just play d5 here, cd Queen, knight takes d5, and after something like queen c4, uh, you can definitely play just queen d6, aiming to play bishop b6 next. And uh, uh, these types of positions are quite unclear and generally sort of resemble, you, you know, the, the normal reverse Sicilians and English opening uh, positions that you get in uh, lines like this, where black has, you know, perfectly reasonable play. There's nothing wrong with it. But the move uh, that Sergei made, a5, is also fine. <clears throat> uh, in reply to that, uh, Fabi goes h3, which I think is maybe stretching it a little bit. Uh, he probably should have played something like bishop e2. There's also an argument for playing d3, but maybe he just didn't want to play g3 that game. But bishop e2, I think, is stronger than h3 if you don't want to uh, play d3 yet, because it's not obvious that you will need the pawn on h3, whereas you almost always will be playing bishop e2 at some point. And after h3, uh, once again, there's nothing wrong with d5, <clears throat> uh, leading to very similar positions to the one uh, we just discussed. But there was also an additional option of knight e4, which we spotted during, uh, during the game because the computer was suggesting it, and we briefly discussed on air. Uh, it looks slightly weird to spend two tempi uh, moving the, the, the knight from f6 to c5, but the, the pawn on b4 is somewhat weak, and uh, after both, let's say, knight e5, knight takes e5, d4, and d6, dc, dc, and bishop e2, let's say, d6, uh, d3, bishop f5, black is just doing quite well, because uh, he even has some outlandish ideas like rook a6, rook b6, putting some pressure on the b3 pawn, but more importantly, he can, he can do something like e4, g, queen takes e4, queen c3, f6, and here black basically quite seriously wants to play queen c2, putting non-joking pressure on the pawn on b3. It's also worth noting that whenever white plays b4, knight a4 is a very good reply. And I think black is just fine here. There's really uh, nothing that he should be worried uh, about in a position like this. I also suspect that this would have suited uh, Sergei better than what he got in the game because his play would have become a lot more straightforward and a lot more uh, sort of uh, instinctively understood. Instead of all this, after h3, Sergei goes b6, Fabi stops uh, fuffling about and uh, finally goes for bishop b2, uh, bishop b7 and castles. And once again, you can play uh, knight e4, knight c5 even here, but uh, you don't really want to do it with a bishop on b7. It makes less sense with a bishop on b7, although even this, you can argue, is a, a very playable idea. The knight might later come to e6, which is not a bad square at all. Black is in general not suffering at all just yet, but Sergei decides to play g5. Once again, you normally associate these positions where black plays d5 with uh, black later developing the bishop towards either bishop f5 or bishop g4, and not developing it to b7, but this is not horrible at all. cd5, knight g5, uh, queen c2, a slightly surprising move, but once again, it feels like maybe Fabi uh, really understood uh, how to prompt uh, unforced errors from Sergei in this game, because objectively, I think it was stronger to go queen c4, rook a d8, and to finally play g3 to stop all the nonsense connected with e4, Black probably plays rook d6 in these types of positions, and white goes rook e1, followed by bishop f1, and then aims to play rook c1, and uh, maybe d4, e4, knight e5 becomes part of his agenda at some point. Maybe he wants to 
try and somehow push uh, before in the later gay stages of the game. But this is a very typical, once again, English opening slash reverse uh, reverse Sicilian type position where, you know, the entire game is ahead of us. Who knows who is better? But Fabi goes queen c2, uh, hinting that maybe he wants to go bishop b5. This is maybe one explanation for using uh, this square. But maybe the bigger one is uh, that you're tempting black to play 5 e 4 which is what Sergei does. He really should have refrained from that. And even if uh, black allows bishop b5 by playing rook d8 instead, after bishop b5, rook d6, the position is really quite playable because this somewhat cavemanish idea of going rook d8, d6, g6, and then starting to sacrifice your pieces to get to the g2 pawn is really not that stupid. For instance, there's a somewhat weird looking line like d3, rook g6, rook e1, and in this position already, there is this move knight d4, after which after bishop takes d4, <laughs> black has this shot knight c3. And uh, somewhat surprisingly, this works out for black. The best play for white here is e4, knight b5, bishop b5, black can take on a3. This is a reasonably balanced position in which black is not even suffering very much. Uh, and in general, uh, rook d8 followed by rook d6 is a very natural way to treat this position where, uh, you know, having gone to all this trouble to developing, uh, to develop the bishop on b7, black should be trying to use this bishop to actually create some play along the long diagonal. But Sergei played e4 quite quickly and after knight h2 he is in a surprising amount of trouble. Uh, his pieces are, whoops, that's the wrong arrow, and this is not great either. Uh, all of these pieces are now... Uh, <laughs> I'm really not great at uh, drawing errors. Are stuck, uh, not doing very much, because the pawn on e4 blocks all of black's play. And conversely, this is now an absolutely monstrous bishop, uh, which is uh, uh, dominating the entire board to a tremendous extent. And also, f2, f3 is just a very strong idea here. Uh, it took me a while to realize just how safe white is uh, opening up their file because there's never any tactics connected with either knight takes e3 or knight f4. Black just doesn't have enough initiative to uh, try anything when the long diagonal is closed. I believe objectively best is something like rook, rook a d8, but even here after f3 white is just uh, uh, seriously better. The move Sergei uh, played, though, uh, Queen g5, is just not great. And uh, Fabi played f4, which is very natural, but even stronger was f3, I think, which would have uh, led to the position uh, they had in the game, but this wouldn't have given black any choice at all. After f4, black could have played something like Queen h4, and uh, his position after something like bishop c4, rook d8, uh, rook f2, followed by knight f1, is really not great at all. But I still think it's better than what he got in the game. In the game, Sergei took en passant, once again, uh, sort of continuing under this misapprehension that uh, he will have some play on the king's side and he should be opening files. But after knight f3, queen g3, and rook f2, it is sort of uh, visually quite clear that this bishop goes either to c4 or to d3. This is an absolute uh, monstrous piece on b2, completely unopposed by anything on the board. Second rook comes to f1. And despite none of white's pieces currently even crossing the third rank, it is white who will be having uh, a very, very strong attack on the king's side, not black. Uh, rook a d8. And here, Fabi's next two moves, you can maybe argue, are not the best. Uh, he played bishop c4, but it was probably better to keep the bishop on e2 and not commit to either two of one of either one of those two move, two squares, and start with rook f1. And here, black's position just collapses in many cases. If black goes knight f6, uh, for instance, it is extremely strong to play knight h2 here, uh, followed simply by knight g4, and white is starting just to crash through because uh, black is forced to take. And then the queen gets uh, smoked out of, uh, of the g3 square with rook f3, rook f4. And uh, black probably will just never consolidate and these bishops will eventually just destroy everything in their, in their path. 
And if Black plays uh, Knight of Six, which is what uh, Sergei did in the game, sorry, uh, Rook E7 first, then Bishop D3, followed by Bishop H7 check. Uh, well, the computer suggests that this is just already completely winning for White because if Black plays King H8, which looks normal, Knight H4, Queen H4, and Rook F7 is basically made. This is not that easy to find in a practical game, but it's a good demonstration of how quickly White goes from uh, sort of coiling up and preparing to strike to actually striking. But Bishop C4 doesn't spoil anything really. Uh, Sergei played Knight F6. Uh, Fabi took. Uh, once again, I think had he played Rook F1, his conversion would have been simpler. But this is also a decent enough move. Uh, Gf Rook F1, Rook D6. And I didn't particularly like uh, Fabi's uh, next couple of moves, but once again, they don't really spoil anything. The computer suggests that if you do, uh, the, the, if you if you follow the uh, the maneuver it likes in this position and also in a lot of positions later on, which is Bishop D3 attacking the pawn on H7, uh, H5, Bishop E4, King G7, and just D3 uh, supporting the Bishop on E4. It's not immediately obvious what white is threatening, but uh, the longer you uh, let the machine run here, the more it becomes convinced that white eventually consolidates, uh, either takes on c6 and goes knight d4, or perhaps uh, does something clever connected with queen e2, followed by knight d2 attacking the h5 pawn, knight comes to c4. Black's position often just collapses under its own weight here. Uh, once white achieves one final strengthening of his pieces. But Fabi's choice to play before is not, not bad at all. Sergei was also running very short on time, so uh, for him uh, life was, al was always going to get only worse. Uh, takes, takes, uh, rook e7, all very natural. Computer suggests some other moves, but in general the evaluation doesn't change very much here. b5, knight e5, knight e4. Uh, creating an absolute super fork on f5, bishop c8, king h1. And this is uh, perhaps the final point in the game where Sergei could have uh, made Fabi calculate. In this position, uh, had, he, uh, had he had more time, I think he would have found the idea of playing f5. The point of this move is that if white does uh, some kind of a passing move, uh, Knight g4 just wins on the spot because this is a threat and this is mate in two. If white takes on f5 here, black takes, you take with the rook, black takes here, black takes here, attacks the pawn on g2. And knowing how well Karakin defends in general, you actually sort of bet on him to hold this position because material is equal, black managed to trade off some of his worst, uh, some of his worst pieces. And yeah, uh, my feeling is he probably would have uh, would have been favored to hold this. Best move after f5 is actually uh, king h1 g1 to stop knight g4. First of all, it's not that easy to play king g1 the moment after you played king h1. And secondly, black has the move f4 here, attacking the pawn on h3. And here I will just show you what the computer suggests is best play. And I believe every single white move for the next five or six move uh, five or six moves is maybe strictly the best move in the position. So Fabi would actually have to do some very, very serious calculating work. Not that he is incapable of it, of course. Queen e4 takes, rook takes f7, rook takes, bishop takes f7, king g7, knight e2, queen h5, h4, queen e7, and g takes e3, rook f6, takes, takes, and also Queen H, uh, Bishop H5 specifically to stop Knight G4. But so much material has been traded off in this position that even something like this endgame after Queen F5 takes, takes Knight G4, Bishop D7, intending to play C7, C5 next move, I really am not entirely sure that this is winning for White, to be honest. There are so many pawns coming off the board very, very quickly that it could very easily turn out that white does not win here. Or at least if he does win, it is uh, connected with a lot of uh, pain and suffering. Uh, having missed that opportunity though, and we can't really blame him very hard because he was uh, running very short on time, uh, Karekin eventually uh, was defeated. He played 
king g7, bishop e2, king h8, basically saying, okay, this is the best setup I have, and you should show me some improvement. And Fabi did show him some improvement. Queen c3, king g7, bishop d1, king g8, bishop c2. This is a very, very clever uh, repositioning of the bishop. It goes to good squares. Queen h4, this is maybe the beginning of the end, but uh, good advice is really hard to come by in this position. Rook f4, queen g3, bishop f5, bishop b7. Here the computer suggests that rook 1 f2 is arguably even stronger than when Fabi, what Fabi did, because in many cases white will be threatening to play bishop g4, knight f5, and then this, this queen on g, g3 might actually be in some trouble later in the game. But bishop e4 is of course not, not a mistake, bishop c8, queen a3, and white is finally poised for final assault, uh, and uh, he finally has direct threats, and the game didn't really last very long from here. So Gabe played king g7, which is well arguably a final mistake, but really the computer suggests that maybe rook e8 is stronger here, but after queen a7, black's position will, will just start collapsing. But after king g7, Fabio, of course, uh, spotted the tactic that after queen a8, black cannot protect the bishop on, d7, on c8 because, uh, let's say, after something like rook e8, white just takes on c8 and this fork once again wins the game. I think when this position appeared on the board, Sergei was down to maybe five minutes. He uh, spent all but about 30 seconds of them looking for a way to continue the game and finally came up uh, with the with, with the last trick, he took on h3, gh, queen takes h3, king g1 and rook takes d4. And if white here takes this rook, then his work is really not that simple after knight g4. Sorry, uh, not not the immediate knight g4 because here there's rook f2, but uh, you start with queen g3 check, I guess, and you go knight g4 then. But even this, of course, uh, white should be able to convert. But there is a cleaner solution here, which of course Fabi did not miss. White goes queen bishop g2, queen g3, rook takes, knight g4. And Fabi even decides not to take on g4 here, which is completely winning. But to keep the entire rook by playing rook f3, queen e1 check and bishop f1. And at this point, uh, the players reach the time control. And uh, having realized just how hopeless his position is, and his position really is... Uh, utterly without hope here, uh, Sergei decided not to make any more pointless moves and resigned. And what can we say about this game? This game, uh, in a way, is uh, a very clear antithesis to uh, what Sergei himself has done to MVL. This is also a very, very clever bit of opening preparation, but it is not aimed at uh, trying to win by force, if, you, if your opponent doesn't find the correct way uh, to equalize in a very, very forcing position. This is uh, Fabi and uh, probably his uh, uh, long-time uh, long second, Rustam Kasimjanov, our good friend here uh, in, uh, at the Chess24 offices. Uh, they probably uh, thought quite deeply about which types of positions uh, it would be good to get against Sergei, even if objectively these, these positions are not necessarily even better for white. And they aimed for a very, very specific game plan, not a specific line, but a very specific game plan, which would give Fabi the best chance of uh, taking uh, Sergei out of his comfort zone. Uh, and it worked splendidly, because uh, Sergei started uh, spending a lot of time on his moves uh, uh, very early on and uh, going astray and uh, it led to Fabi winning a very very nice game with white. And with this I will conclude my recap of rounds in 4 and 5. I, I did try not to talk too much but it's still a 40 minute uh, video for this. Uh, I apologize. I hope you <laughs> you've borne with me up to this point and I hope you, uh, you enjoyed this video. This has been uh, Peter Svidler for Chess24. Uh, see you uh, uh, at our live uh, live premium coverage uh, of the uh, Altibox uh, Norwich Tournament 2018. Thanks for watching.